Well, hello, everybody. This is Dr. Tony Evans with The Urban Alternative, and I am so excited about today's program. I'm excited to have you with us because this is a first. <laughs> this is the first time I have had all four of my children with me to share with you, our friends. I have my oldest daughter, Crystal, my second, Priscilla, my third, Anthony Jr., and the baby of the family, Jonathan. <laughs> and uh, we are here for a very special reason, because we've been collaborating on a very special and very personal project. It's called Divine Disruption. When God intervenes in your affairs or life intervenes in your affairs, and you need God at a whole nother level. And I know many of you, even coming through this season we've been through, have uh, had to go through your share of those kinds of trials. And so we're inviting you in through Divine Disruption, not only the book, but this program, into our thoughts and struggles that we've gone through as we uh, worked on this project because we've gone through it. So this is not <laughs> theory, and nor is it theoretical, uh, this was the reality of life that uh, we we faced and that you faced and that we all need to face together. So uh, I'm just glad to have uh, all of you here. And I guess a great opening question is just before we get into some of the specifics, as you look at the overall journey we've been through, what are some of y'all's reactions? Some of your just just wrote feelings and thoughts about the pain of the problem uh, that we have gone through and some perspectives that you have. Well, I think for me, it's just, um, it's a lot of hurt and disappointment. Yeah. Because I just felt, I felt disappointed in God, specifically with, with mommy, but everything that has been going on, but obviously mommy, the closest for me, losing my mom and all of the, all of the prayer, all of the, you know, quoting God's word back in his face, you know, going back to your sermons and saying, okay, this is what dad said. Let's do it this yeah. way. This is what the word says. And you feel like you're trying to do everything right. You're trying mm -hmm. to, to run the race as hard as you can um, for my mom, but also because, you know, wanting to see God display himself in a mighty way for a testimony. You know, a lot of people, just to say that, are afraid to admit that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that they can get emotionally disappointed with God or confused by God. I mean, you know, what did Rebecca say? Well, look, how long? Uh, yeah. God, we're going to do this, and why are we doing this? And, and uh, there, there are many of questions in the Bible about how God is doing what he's doing, why he's doing it, how, how it got done, and was it fair, and all mm -hmm. is there justice with God, and those questions. And sometimes you can't just wish them away because they just come to your mind due to your circumstances. And that's why you have to have a faith dip, deeper than your feelings because mm -hmm. when your feelings take over, they can make your faith fly out of the window. That's right. And my perspective was the same as Jonathan's. I, I, um, I, being the most emotional of the kids, I tell everybody that just right off the bat, I'm the one who feels the most. I had to uh, really h learn how to hold on to my faith in a moment like that, where you're believing what you've read, you're knowing that God can come through and he's deciding not to. Through all this, what I've experienced is God holding on to me in a way that I would have never experienced otherwise. And I don't want to go through this ever again. I want all of our family members back. But uh, if you read the instruction manual in your car and you hear about the safety features and how the seatbelts work and how the airbags work, that's one thing. But skidding or slamming on the brakes or getting into a wreck and the seatbelt holding you back and airbags coming out and you realize you still went through the wreck, but you realizing that that manual actually performed the way that it said it was going to. And yeah, that's the way worked. I feel. Yes, I felt the seatbelt of his word holding me in my seat when I could have gone flying through the windshield. I needed to feel that. And well, he, where did you learn that. to illustrate like that? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Girls, anything that you want to say? Well, I would echo um, exactly what Jonathan and Anthony just said. Those were the two things that were coming to my mind. The first thing was that you can ask your questions, and Dad, you taught this at church, you can ask your questions without questioning the character of God. And so I appreciate that Job or Habakkuk, we can look at them and see that God allowed them 
to to ponder and to wonder and to be and to express mm-hmm. discouragement and you don't find a god who condemns them for those questions but rather he meets them where they are mm-hmm. and he reminds them I'm still who I said I am I'm still going to do what I said I was going to do so I'm I felt through all of this very grateful for a god who lets us be human <laughs> he knows we're human mm-hmm. the flip side of that is like Anthony said I have never seen such tangible proof of the Holy Spirit's presence as I have in the past couple of years. So for those who don't know, we've literally lost, including my mother-in-law who passed away six months after mom, um, we've lost eight family members, eight. And it was like back to back stuff that just Mm -hmm. kept happening. And so of course, what you express, John John is true. Like, of course we're gonna say, God, what? What Mm -hmm. is this? But then the flip side is you look back and go, how are we able to still have moments of levity in that or get a good night's sleep or hold food down in our stomachs, you know? Or preach a day after. Or dad yeah. still preaching on Sundays or us still parenting our kids, you know, getting up out of bed and putting clothes on. There are some people who don't know the hope that Jesus offers and the strengthening power of the Holy Spirit that one of the things that hit our family could hit them and they can't, they, they can't function. So apart from the Holy Spirit of God strengthening us, that's what that reminded me of, that we can get up, put clothes on, sleep at night, eat food during the day, parent our children, and still put one foot in front of the other. That, to me, was proof that the Holy Spirit is who he says that you he can't, is. And, and that's the thing is that I, I had moments where I was discounting that because yeah. you don't, you just know how you feel and what you're going through, but you're not thinking about even in that, the Spirit of God is holding you from drowning. But you don't think about it. Yeah. Because all you're thinking about is the moment, what you're going through, who's hurt, the pain. Like people say, the one set of footprints in the sand is God carrying you Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. through this moment. It's crazy. You know, you, you made a great uh, statement because a lot of people don't know the difference between asking God a question and questioning God. Yeah. Those are not the same thing. Mm-hmm. And if you can, if you conflate them to be the same thing, then you wind up feeling guilty about a legitimate question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's okay to ask God why. It's not okay to challenge God, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. with the why. Mm-hmm. And so learning that distinction is, is very important because that frees you up to be honest with God and not try to hide what's really going on inside, which he already knows anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think yeah, definitely. One of the ways that I had to learn how to experience God's mercy is to look for his mercy in unexpected places. Because a lot of times, the byline of this book is holding on faith when life breaks your heart. And I was trying to figure out what's a new way I can try to learn how to hold on to my faith because my grip was getting getting a little loose. One of the things that I haven't really voiced that much because it doesn't really, really even sound right to voice is me asking God for mercy. We went on that trip in August to, uh, we just went to McKinney, Texas and got a little place together. And I prayed, we prayed and had communion together. And I prayed, God, show us mercy. I literally felt like somebody was, like the game you played when little, he was bending my wrist back and breaking my knuckles. And I was like, mercy, mercy. You remember that game? Yeah. 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 I felt like that's what God was allowing to happen. Now in hindsight, Mm -hmm. as much as I want our mother here, if he was going to choose to take her home, which he did, I found in, under in a crevice, I found mercy in the fact that he took her before the pandemic hit. Oh, now, yeah. Now, that's oh finding mercy in a crevice. Like, you, mm-hmm. if you have to look that hard for <laughs> yeah. it, that's finding it under a rock. Those moments um, and and the peace that he gave me, because I'm the one who'll give up on hope real quick. Those His mercy, I, I found it in, in very unique places. And I think a lot of times when you're trying to hold on to faith through disruptions, that's what you have to do. Dad, I feel like your audience, just because we're here with 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 everyone, I feel like I want to ask you, as your son and as your kids, mm-hmm. how are you doing? Like we we know Tony Evans, the preacher, can pull it together and <laughs> give a sermon at, at any time. But how are you yeah. doing? I, I say on a scale from one to ten, I ask him this all the time. He does. <laughs> on a scale from one to ten, how are you doing? Depends on when you ask me. Yeah. Uh, because right. some days are good and strong, and other days are weak and dragging. You know, when you're in those quiet moments, when the house is quiet, uh, nobody's there to greet you, nobody's in the, mm. you know, in the space that you're used to, uh, you can get you can get a little down. You can get yeah. well when you're flooded with memories. So people remind you, even when they give condolences, mm-hmm. they're triggers that can take you from what you're focusing on then to the things that bring you uh, memories or 
hurts or, or losses, all of that affects the number that I can I can give, you know. Mm-hmm. But there's a roller coaster ride, right? Uh, you know, and you keep plowing forward. But just, mm-hmm. there are challenges, and then there are times of great memories and celebrations as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think what made that time remarkably difficult, on top of the fact that we lost mommy, and on top of the fact that there were multiple people in our family who passed away was that all of those people were connected to you. Did you personally feel like, even though it's life and losing your loved ones is a part of life, did you feel ever, or do you even feel now, that the way God allowed things to to play out was slightly unfair? You know, I did have the question, why? Why this? Why now? Why this much? But I never questioned God. Uh, My biblical beliefs had to kick in, particularly Isaiah 40, when they were asking, you know, this is not fair in Isaiah 40. Where's the justice due me? And then God says, okay, you got to look at me. Because if you look at your circumstances, I'm the everlasting God, I'm the creator, and you're going to have to look to me for new strength. Because the problem with the question why is, is it often doesn't get an answer. Yeah. That's in the your problem. case, are you saying that, that the question yeah, did not uh, yeah, get answered? Uh, yeah. I, I can't answer the question, why this, why this now, why there wasn't uh, supernatural healing when there were things that indicated. Mm-hmm. I mean, we had some yeah. We had some killer indicators. Yeah. Things that, yes, that if, if, when, when we talk about the doctor we met at the right time, when we talk about this new medication that had come out and medicinal treatment. When we, when we talk about all of these details, the, it's staggering to think that it wasn't going to be reversed. I had to appeal to what I knew to be true about God while still asking questions along the way. That's what chapter five is all about, between expectancy and reality. Like that, that space between what you're expecting and the reality. And we watched you, I, I know I can speak on all, for, on behalf of all four of us and the church, we watched you handle that space in a in an amazing way, really, to, to look back on that. And I, I think that, in fact, I know this to be true, that the members of your church and the broader Christian community that have respected you so much as a scholar, a theologian, a pastor, and all of these different capacities, there's a deeper appreciation now, having seen your humanity in a way they've never seen that before. The tenderness with which you spoke and preached and ministered as you yourself were struggling and the vulnerability you had to tell your church, here's how I feel today and here's how Mm -hmm. I'm hurting today and here's the struggle. They saw tears fall from your eyes and the vast majority of people in your local church had never seen that side of Tony Evans. Mm -hmm. And I think for people in leadership sometimes, you know, pastors, teachers, preachers, whatever, that you can stand on a platform and folks see that, but there is a depth of ministry that happens. And dad, you have exemplified that so powerfully and beautifully to so many people. Well, you know, it's uh, it's one thing to preach it <laughs> and to believe it when you're not experiencing it. Yes. It's a whole nother <laughs> ball game to preach it and believe it in the midst of experiencing it is a, the window between my father passing and my wife passing was about a month uh, gap between mm-hmm. those. So I was flying to Baltimore mm-hmm. to care for my father, flying back here with, of course, uh, y'all helping me to care for uh, your mom. But two things helped me uh, within that. My father's strong faith mm. and your mom's strong faith. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I did have faith helping faith when faith was weak mm-hmm. by those who we were trying to have faith for. Yeah, yeah. who so, should in that moment so, should have the yeah. least amount of faith. The, yeah. They were the ones with the most. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. So it definitely was, was the most trying time and still repercussions of that time continue. But I'm bolstered. I mean, your mom challenged me to keep preaching the word mm-hmm. in spite of the illnesses she was going through. It was, a, it was a very spiritual time in a very painful situation. Mm-hmm. 
one of the very unique things about this this project and this book is that for the first time, and I, I've never had a I've never owned a book where you've had five different points of view and five different perspectives from a nuclear family. So since we're here, I would love to hear um, how you, the byline of this book, is holding on to faith when life has broke broken your heart. What are the ways specific to you, Jonathan? Because we're all four so different that you have held on to faith in spite of all the loss. And I'd love to just go around and hear. It's the faith of my family yeah. that mm-hmm. I that I come from. Having daddy and mommy teaching me my whole life and then having you, my siblings, being able to share how you feel, but your faith and hope through it all has really helped gird me up because I didn't have to go through it and do it by myself. I think um, mommy's funeral was a big deal. Yeah. Her celebration, um, the celebration of her life in her going home to be with the Lord was done well, and it was well attended in person and online. And I say that because um, as beautiful as mommy um, was and as much pride as she took in her appearance and how she showed up anywhere, she showed up looking like a million dollars. (laughs) That's true. Um, She made it her business to do a lot of foundational work in a lot of places Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to not get the applause to not be on the stage to not go first and she was very intentional in supporting daddy in ministry and then also um, supporting us I think about the fact that across the mantle in our home it was a big deal to her to have something from each one of us up on the mantle um, as her trophies Mm -hmm. And so to have the opportunity to celebrate her life well, to me, matched how well she lived her life. And I say all that because Mm. holding on to faith is the idea that this is not all there is. 100%. And that after we're gone, there is more celebration. There is more to be celebrated. There are ripple effects that will go on from generation to generation because of what we choose to do. And I know, as we all do, hearing mommy talk, that there were multiple moments in her life where she wondered. Mm -hmm. So even now, when you have to wonder, God, what were you doing? Even now, if you have to wonder, why here, why now? In light of the celebration that comes later, Mm -hmm. the questions, the struggles, the doubts that you have right now are no match for that celebration. So her example makes me remember that the feeling of right now is no match for the celebration of the decisions that you make and the outcome, the ripple effects of those decisions over the lifetime. I think for me, holding on to faith has meant that even when I can't see what the ripple effect is, what the celebration is, what the outcome is, what the trophies are, that the faithfulness when you can't see is what counts. Mm-hmm. That's great. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for me, holding on to hope, what encouraged me most in that is my children, probably. Mm. I realize as a child of mom and dad that the way I've watched them walk through our whole lives with a commitment and a consistency and an integrity, they weren't different people at church than they were at home. I want to have that same impact on my kids. I want them to know that the same God I've been telling them about and teaching them about and rearing them to honor, that if I trusted him when everything was good, I want them to be able to say, and let me tell you, grandchildren of Priscilla Shire, that your grandmother still honored God even when stuff was really hard. Mm. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Um, for, For me, I had to come to a pivotal point in my life and in my faith where I had to ask myself, do you believe what you say you believe or not? That, that, <laughs> yeah. I got that That's far. That's the bottom line, I got right? that far, yeah. Because it, um, it, on many levels, what, being on a stage and singing is one thought, but just in general, I had to ask myself, do you believe what you're singing or not? And when I made that decision and said, yes, I do believe this, and I believe that God can hold me through this, then I had to start acting like I believe what I'm saying. So if she's fine, and she's enjoying the, enjoying presence, of the presence of Jesus, and 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 uh, and we're not far from her. I really look, 
this is uh, I don't want to talk too much because I know people want to hear you talk, Daddy. That's but <laughs> but um, you have my name. Hey, that's there true. You go. Ooh, and I'm the only one. <laughs> that's <laughs> no. correct. <laughs> no, I, I really do believe our experience, like a baby in a mom's womb, has no idea that it's it's comfortable and cozy, and has no idea that it's two inches away from another reality that's so much bigger than what it's currently experiencing. Mm-hmm. Mommy has gone on to that new reality, and I feel like. Yeah, our world, this world we're in is comfortable and cozy, but we're two inches away from experiencing a whole Mm. other thing that is so much bigger than where we are right now. And when I think about us being in the womb of earth and being cozy, and but what God's intention for us is, is to be on this other side where he has so much more for us. And it's just two inches away. Like right through this is this whole other experience. And mommy's there and it's that close. I feel like when I decided to believe what I believe, I know that my mom is close. Yeah, I know and great. I feel and I experience her close. And that has how I've held on to hope. And that's God's mercy. Because I was yeah. the one to be like, I am Done out. With this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this experience in faith mm. has, has yeah. um, taken a load off in so many different areas because I just decided I believe fully and not just when it's easy. There, there's this moment, actually a really private moment with our family. But it's the morning that mom passed away. And I just want to describe it because I see in dad's actions in that moment exactly what you just described. So we were all around mom. We were in their bedroom. It was clear that these were going to be her last couple of hours. And there we were, just the six of us. Mom was laying in my lap. Anthony's Mm -hmm. on one side, Crystal's on one side. And dad's laying right next to her. Her and we're all around her like a cocoon. And I looked over at dad and dad, you were rubbing mommy's hand. She wasn't conscious at this point. You're rubbing her hand. We were playing worship music and you were reading Psalm 91. You were just reading it. You weren't talking. You weren't trying to help everybody. You weren't angry. You were just reading Psalm 91. And Anthony, you just described not knowing what to do. Sometimes you just go, I'm going to honor God in this moment. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know why this is happening, but what can I do in this moment to just release it to God and then trust him? And I watched our Superman dad, because you know, we kind of think you're Superman. (laughs) Um, I just watched you. You literally at that point realized I cannot do anything else. And so all you did was open up the Bible and start reading Psalm 91. That's yeah. interesting. I didn't remember that yeah. till, you, till you just brought it back up. That that's was the response. Um, the toughest statement I had to make in that moment was to say, you know, not my will, but thy will be done. That's that's mm-hmm. a hard thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. When the will is not what you want, you know, <laughs> you know. And I I talked to myself and us and the church. You know, about God's conditional will and his unconditional will. Certain things God is going to do because God is going to do it. There are no conditions tied to it. It's unconditional. But then there's certain things that are conditional. He will only do it when we've done our part, prayer, obedience, whatever it is. God took this out of our hands. Yeah, he did. We had prayed. We'd mm-hmm. been to the doctor. We tried every new medication. we have gone to MD Anderson in Houston. Holistic effort. Holistic effort. We, there was no stone to our knowledge unturned. And she had to be the most prayed for woman (laughs) in in America or the world at that point. (laughs) Because we had asked all of our radio listeners and everybody who knew the ministry to pray. So everything that could be done to our knowledge was done. So I had to resolve to the fact that this was God's unconditional will. Because if, if it was conditional... We met the conditions. We met the conditions. <laughs> we, went, we went extra credit, yeah. okay? <laughs> so this was his unconditional will, and uh, we had to resolve ourselves to that and still pray and praise and trust God in spite of it. I, I really believe, bottom line, is that you do what you can and God will do what you can't. Like you said, Daddy, exhaust what you can do and then just trust that God's going to do the rest. You know, Crystal, in chapter 15 of this book, you talk a lot about the 
doing the right thing along the way? What are some of the, the right things that you would encourage those who are joining us today to do along the way as they faced their disruption? It's kind of what you said about doing what you can and God will do what you can't. It's this idea that you work with the knowledge that you have. Mama used to say, you go with the light that God has given you until he gives you more light. And until he gives you more light, you do what he told you to do last. Mm -hmm. Often in the Bible, what God is looking for are people who are willing to work with the little information they have. He's looking for people who are willing to say yes, to say yes quickly, and to do what they know the best that they can do with all of their might. And what we have, what God has allowed us to have, is enough until he gives us more. Mm. That's a part of the trust factor, that if what I have isn't enough, that God is big enough to fill in the gap. Well, this is, uh, this is great. It's great being together uh, as a family. We've stayed close as a family. It's great doing this special project. Thanks and, for letting and, us on your radio program, Dad. And, <laughs> yeah, we, well, you deserve one shot. So, <laughs> <laughs> so radio and television. But I'm glad for this project because your mom wanted us to do something together. So Anthony put together this, uh, this work, this book, uh, Divine Disruption, and, um, and keeping hope alive when, you know, things are breaking in your heart and in your life. And so we're, 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 we're glad to have the process of doing this together because we all shared in the pain of it together. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we're all growing from the purpose of it together. And I, I want God to touch, touch the folks who, who hear and see this, that when, when your heart breaks and your hope is shattered, that that is a fresh opportunity to experience God in a new way. It's the seed of the word divinity that entered into the egg of a woman humanity. Well, I guess that's why Jesus is called the son of God and the son of man. I guess that's why he could die as a man one moment, but get up from a grave another moment. Nobody ever been like him. Nobody is like him. Nobody will ever be like him. He is one of a kind. He's in a class by himself because he is the most unique person in the universe. If you drive around and look at some of the Christmas decor, you'll often see in front of houses Christmas boxes that have been wrapped and dressed for the season. But in virtually all of those boxes, it's empty inside. Those are boxes for show. They want you to get the look of Christmas, but not necessarily the content of Christmas. And so they're empty boxes that look good. Unfortunately, what's true of those boxes is true of the culture. It's become empty decor. It's surrounded by lights, frivolity. It's surrounded by family gatherings and food. It's surrounded by parties. And of course, you get off of work. But it's increasingly empty of the reason for the season empty of the reality of why Christmas in the first place and why Christmas matters. So I just want to take a few moments of you to set the stage for the key to understanding this holiday. Let me cite it for you. God became a man through the virgin birth in order to redeem sinful humanity. God became a man, Emmanuel, through the process of a virgin birth with the purpose to redeem sinful mankind. If you miss that, you've missed Christmas. Amen. You've missed the divinely ordained reason for the season. If it winds up about everything else and not about that, you had a holiday, but you didn't have Christmas. Because the key to understanding the celebration of this day is that God became a man through the process of the virgin birth in order to 
redeem sinful mankind. The question that you and I need to understand is why? Why God becoming a man? Why through a virgin birth in order to achieve that goal? Why, 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 why that? Because many people know the what, but not the why. So I want to just take a moment to share the why. It all started with three words. Found in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, where God says, let them rule. Let them rule. God turned the running of the earth over to mankind. He said, I'm going to create earth, but I'm going to lease it out to mankind to rule. I will give them the choice. They can rule it with me or without me, but I'm going to let them rule. Every tree of the garden you may freely eat, the tree of the garden you may not eat, lest you die. I'm going to give you the option. You can Decide not to or decide to, but I'm giving the earth over to you. Psalm 115 verse 16 says, the heavens belong to God, the earth belongs to man. Unless you understand that, then you will not understand why there's so much chaos, why there's so much crime, why there's so much difficulty, why there's so much conflict. You won't understand that because you'll raise the question, why won't God do something? Because he turned it over. He said, I'm going to give man the freedom to decide what to do with this gift I'm going to give them called the world. And I will give them the choice. Within certain boundaries, I will give them the choice of how they handle it. In the midst of that, Lucifer, better known as Satan, slithered into the garden through a snake to lay claim of something that had been given to man. He wanted the earth, but the earth didn't belong to him. It belonged to mankind. So in order for him to get it, it had to be gifted to him. He didn't come as a lion. He didn't come as a tiger. He didn't come as an elephant, he came as a serpent because he could not win it by power, he had to win it by deception. And the snake was the sneakiest creature he could come up with. And it was at that moment that the deception occurred and in a choice by Adam and Eve, they gifted the world over to the devil, which is why the Bible says that Satan is the god of this world. He got it because it was gifted. Amen. And he got the gift because the gift was given to mankind by God. When Adam, like in a football team, jumped offside, when a football player jumps offside, the whole team is penalized. Because they're part of something bigger than just the individual who jumped offside. When Adam and Eve jumped offside and rebelled against God, the team of humanity was penalized. Unless you get too mad at Adam, you and I have jumped offside too in decisions that have rebelled against God. But because God was not going to change his gift and the earth had to be run by man for it was given to man, it had to be redeemed by man. And since God and the core of his being is a spirit, he could not be the redeemer for the thing he had gifted. It had to come through a human being. Galatians 4 verse 4 says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son born of a woman under the law. In the fullness of time means at the exact moment it should have happened in history. When the process was completed, when the time was just right, God sent his son. But there's a problem. There's a 4,000 year gap 
between when Adam fell and when Jesus was born. There are 4,000 that God, why is it taking you so long to fix this problem 4,000 years ago that we've got to wait 4,000 years for Christmas Day to resolve this problem Because it had to be resolved, according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, by the seed of the woman, it says, that will crush the head of the serpent. Interesting. Not the seed of a man, but the seed of a woman. But women don't have seed, they have egg. Men have seed. So way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God prophesied, that the one who would come or would step on the head of the serpent would come without the help of a man. For it would be through the seed of a woman. But this child that had to be born had to meet certain specifications, namely perfection. Because a sinful man couldn't serve as a substitute for other sinful men. So it had to be a person who was Perfect. So therefore, the stage had to be set for the person to arrive who could be the redeemer for mankind. And it took God 4,000 years to set that up. He would come with one person. They would get a piece of it, then fail. Another person, they would get another piece of it and fail. There'd be a prophet who would get a piece of it and fail. A king who would get a piece of it and fail. It would be family systems that would get a piece of it and fail. And over and over and over again, progress and failure, progress and failure, progress and failure, progress and failure. Until he came up with the Cupid part of the plan. Because you see, the prophecy said, that the Messiah had to come from the line of David. So he had to get two people to fall in love who were from the Davidic line. So when you read Matthew chapter 1, it says Joseph was from the line of David legally. When you read Luke chapter 3, Mary was from the line of Jesus biologically. The two meet and fall in love, both from the Davidic line. So God playing Cupid over time through the line of David, let these two meet, fall in love, and then he shows up and tells Mary, it's you. It's time. For a virgin shall conceive, Isaiah chapter 7, 14. She will bear a son. Hmm. A virgin shall conceive. Her son. Mary says, How is this possible? I've known not a man. The Lord will do this. But now, how? How is this going to work? John 1 1 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, it was pre existent, it was with God, it was coexistent. It was God. It was self-existent. Pre-existent, co-existent, self-existent. That is the word. And the word became flesh. Ooh. So when we talk about humanity, we're talking about the word. Well, that's consistent because when God created Adam, he did it with the word. He spoke. And out of that came creation. So he was going to Bring about a pregnancy in a virgin through a word. Oh, what a fertilization this is. Because it's the seed of the word, divinity, that entered into the egg of a woman, humanity. Well, I guess that's why Jesus is called the Son of God and the Son of Man. Amen. I guess that's why he could get thirsty one moment and walk on water another moment. I guess that's why he could die as a man one moment, but get up from a grave another moment. Because he is the most unique person in the universe. He's the God man. Nobody ever been like him. Nobody is like him. Nobody will ever be like him. He is one of a kind. He's in a class by himself. And he was God's answer to having a man fix it. And he would become that man. But he would do it through a system 
a prophetic, revelatory, historical, perfect revelation to set the stage for the arrival in the fullness of time. So if you want to talk about Christmas, if you want to talk about the reason for the season, you're not just talking about some baby in a cradle, you're talking about God in a crib. You're talking about the baby that made his mama. You, 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 you're not talking about, in fact, the Bible says over and over again, Colossians chapter 1 says that he is the exact image of God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says he's the exact representation of God. John chapter 15 verses 8, John chapter 14 verses 8 and 9, Thomas said, uh, Philip said, we've been with you, Jesus. We like hanging out with you, but when are we going to see the Father? Jesus said, have you been with me this long and you don't get it? When you've seen me, you have seen the Father. For the word has become flesh. But the reason why Jesus is critical is because God operates from heaven. Jesus operates on earth. So if you skip Jesus and just hang out with God, you don't get help on earth. Because he is the God man. The man because the earth was given to man. So when earth ain't right, you better hook up with Jesus because he's the man tied to earth. That's why he says all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. I'm in charge up there and down here. I'm in charge of the sweet by and by and the nasty here and now. So you've got three reactions to Jesus. One is you welcome him. St. John chapter 1 verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. The Greek words receive means to welcome, to embrace. It's it's when you embrace him as your savior, when you trust him for eternal life, when you go to him for the forgiveness of sins and the free gift of eternal life, which he awards to anybody who comes to him by faith to receive it. But then after you welcome him as savior, you welcome him as Lord. It means he gets the final say so to govern your life. It means he becomes the dictator of your existence. To receive him as savior gives you heaven to follow him as Lord gives you earth. You welcome him, then you worship him. The Bible says to worship God only. So how does Jesus receive worship? Either he's an idol or he's the only God you worship. He received worship as God. It reminds me of the three wise men, the three wise men. They saw his star in the east, and they came, and they asked Herod, where is the king of the Jews that we might worship him? But as you traverse around this Christmas season and you see nativity scenes, if you see wise men at baby Jesus' crib, that is incorrect. The wise men were not at baby Jesus' crib. They saw a star in the east. When they arrived, it says, they saw the child in the house, not the baby in the manger. The Greek word trial means toddler, which is why Herod wanted to kill all the babies two years and under. Jesus is a toddler. So if they saw his star when he was born and they didn't get to him when he was a toddler, that meant they took a two-year trip to worship him. Now help me out. If they can take a two-year trip to worship him, we can certainly take a 30-minute drive to give him some glory. So you worship him. And then finally, you witness to him. You don't become ashamed of him. You don't, you don't just try to hide Jesus by being generic God. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. He says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. And if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. So when you go to God to pray, Jesus has got to okay that prayer. And one of the things Jesus is going to be looking for is how public are you about me? If you're a secret agent Christian, then I can't help you. If you're a spiritual CIA representative, I can't help you. Everybody else coming out the closet, we might as well come out too. It should be absolutely inexplicable.
inexplicably clear that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, not merely a believer in God. It should be inextricably clear that he is your savior for heaven and your Lord for earth. If people can celebrate a touchdown, you ought to be able to celebrate a savior. If people gather in their church houses called stadiums and spend three hours giving their home team glory, you ought to be able to spend a few minutes giving him glory on Sunday morning because he's worthy to be praised. And when a lineman makes a big play, you've seen them.